Etzanoa is, archaeologically speaking, just a fascinating puzzle. A very large town, larger than the modern day town, that is invisible. It's a major concentration of human population in a time and a place where nobody expected that. Previously, archaeologists classified sites according to a variety of sorts. So you can have a temporary campsite, a village, a town, a city. Megasites are, is a new category uh, that are very large but do not seem to have the characteristics of a full-fledged city and do not seem to be on the road to becoming a city. And so our site is one of those. Etzanoa is one town of quite a few towns in what was called Kivira. And it's in the account of the Onati expedition. We have this one set of observations made in 1601 by the soldiers that Onyate brought with him, who literally counted the houses in the community. They sent out a scouting expedition, men on horseback who were gone all day, and who came back and said, well, it just continues on. There is another town it starts about five miles upriver from the one we're working on, and it goes for another five miles, is what it looks like. And to the east, more really big towns. So I'm estimating 200,000 people, maybe, uh, be a reasonable estimate, larger than any other political unit of its day in what's now the United States, by a lot. Not by a little, by a lot. It is on both sides of the Walnut River, which flows out of the Flint Hills and originally had crystal clear permanent water and a good hardwood forest in the bottomlands and a whole series of springs that issue from the bluff on which we're, we're currently digging. It's the right sort of place. So the Mayan cities are all on top of or near a cave or cenote that gives access to the underworld. Our bluff has a whole series of those, including one that showed up in the magnetometry readings. You can see there's a very long channel down below where we are that feeds out somewhere on the edge at the base of the bluff. So water from the underworld is what powers the earth and we have it in spades. There is rock art and some of it's quite unusual and some of it's form that's widespread. So the widespread form is cupules on some large boulders that probably, uh, interpolating from other places where we know people did that, uh, for fertility magic for women to guarantee getting pregnant. Adjacent to that, there's some rock art that is like none other that I've ever seen but I think we have an idea of how to interpret it. And it has to do with movement of water out of and back into the underworld. And so there are little miniature depictions of caves that feed into squares cut into the rock. And very often a square is a depiction of this world. And then with a channel that leads to, in one really nice case, to a big hole in the rock where it disappears back into the underworld. So this idea of a cave that has water coming out of it is especially a sacred place. It gives you uh, contact with the spirits of the underworld. So 
It is a depiction of this cosmological motif that is it's well known in Mesoamerica. It existed up here too, and this is clear evidence of it. Spanish on their way here in 1601 encountered a group of people that they ended up calling Escanchaques, and over the course of events, they managed to insult them pretty dramatically. And when the Spaniards decided to turn back and start heading to New Mexico, they got back to the first part of the town they'd come to, and the Escanchaques were lying in wait for them. And there was an afternoon-long battle, and the Spaniards had cannons, and the natives had bows and arrows. But it was a pretty uneven battle. So it was a, a first major organized battle in what is now the United States. And so it's of high interest. We are trying to figure out, well, how big was the battlefield? We don't know that. We discovered some iron shot that tells us, yes, we know where the battle took place. We have yet to see any of the arrow points that were shot by the natives going the other way, and I really want to see those. They're, they will tell us a lot. The site is huge. We are digging, you know, we've been there for several years. We're not up to 1% of the site area, and we're not anywhere near that. I doubt we're one-tenth of 1% 1 of the site area. So there's going to be lots of different things to find, and we just did not expect to hit what we did, right? We, our initial information was a trash mound, which was I thought was great. We can get a really nice sample of material culture. Well, we're getting a bit of material culture, but not very much. And then when I thought it was just an activity area, we ended up with this mystery of two layers of subsoil up on top of an activity area which made no sense. And it's this, when, once I finally realized as we were digging that we're in a ceremonial area. That's what's going on. And so the thermal imaging that gave us that big circle, it's not too far away, right? And this big vertical post, uh, all of that goes together nicely, and what the magnetometry found down the hill, again, this would be to the south, was a cluster of deeply buried roasting pits of some sort. So probably a food preparation area there for it. So it's, the picture is emerging. It's not, not what we expected at all. We have pottery that was probably made in Eastern Colorado. We have a piece of pottery made in North Dakota, stuff from the Gulf Coast. And what was coming out of the ground this summer was repeatedly Caddo pottery from East Texas. So the pottery is fancy. It's not the usual run-of-the-mill plain pottery. So uh, we're getting quite a, quite a sample of people they were in contact with. We have found lots of special tools. That's one of the obvious things when you look at the remains that come out of the ground. I did an estimate based on a large sample. 83% of the chipstone tools are for processing bison, for killing them and butchering them and preparing uh, jerky and so on. That's extraordinary. I think that's why the sites were so big, was that they were hunting whole herds of bison with several thousand hunters at a time, going out and slaughtering the whole herd. Massive amounts of bison hunting and processing, and then they had lots of friends come and visit them. Quivira was at the center of the supply of bison products. There are bison rawhide shields all the way to the west coast of Mexico. They're in the Colorado River in Arizona. 
They're at the fall line in South Carolina. A whole room full of rawhide shields and helmets and leather armor. Juan Cabrillo sailed up the, and found two cow horns on an island off the coast of California. Bison, it has to be. There weren't any cattle around. So literally coast to coast. It's a big, complicated story, and there's, there's so much to be done. It completely unravels most people's understanding of what Native societies were like. Many more people, stable population, sophisticated people, people like us.